I thought I'd just uh, draw some thoughts out of this truly remarkable story as to the parable of our own deliverance. And hopefully um, you'll know some of it, but it's just a good reminder of, uh, of what God has done in our lives. And as we think about the plagues rolling across the land of Egypt, it was truly an awe-inspiring uh, time where God, with devastating power, made a distinction, a difference between the nation of Israel that was his firstborn son, the nation that he loved and was determined to bring out of Egypt and a difference between them and the Egyptians. It was really his determination to, to save and deliver all of us from the bondage of Egypt. And that idea of of Israel being in bondage is really a theme that that starts at the start of the book of Exodus. So come with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter one, because sometimes uh, I was just thinking about this yesterday, actually, you know, where we live in such a comfortable age where, you know, even with the restrictions of COVID, we're all living in basically luxury. You know, I don't know about how it is for you, but, you know, there's a couple of things we have to do over here, but otherwise, like we have it so good compared to the rest of the world and perhaps the rest of time that it's hard to sometimes remind ourselves that we are in bondage. We are in bondage uh, to sin and to the world in which we live. And God has promised to deliver us from that bondage. So look at these words in Exodus 1 and verses 13 and 14. This is how the story of Exodus begins. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. We turn the page to Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. We come across to chapter six in verse five. I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Cruel bondage, bitter bondage, hard bondage. This is the story of our lives, despite how comfortable we have it in our modern age. But God is absolutely determined to deliver. I will bring you out. I will rid you. I will redeem you. This is really the story of God's determination to deliver us. And this evening, I just wanted to dwell on one particular phrase that occurs in the story of the Exodus that just seemed to jump off the page uh, in the story of these plagues. And I just want to share it with you this evening. Because as the astounding plagues rolled across Egypt, as wave after wave systematically destroyed everything that they had, catastrophe after catastrophe, wreaking havoc upon the nation of Egypt. There was something that was particularly striking in the way in which God enacted these plagues. And it wasn't just the unbelievable plagues that came, like flies and frogs and lice and locusts and hail. It was the unbelievable manner in which they disappeared. And we see it in the first uh, the first time we see it is actually in the plague of the flies. If you will, come to Exodus chapter 8. And here's the phrase we want to concentrate on for our evening together. It's in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 31. Yahweh did according to the word of Moses, and he removed 
the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people, there remained not one. The removal was so complete, so absolute that there was not a single fly left. Now, I don't know how many flies you have in Canada. We don't have a whole lot here, but if you've been to Australia, you will know there's a lot of flies. And can you imagine, like, the ground is just, like, it was a plague of flies. It was littered with maybe, like, a foot of flies. Last week, I only worked four days. And then... All of a sudden, and then you'd have seventy tired. some. Yeah, you would have had seventy some hours. The next day, there's not a single play, not a single fly left. You couldn't even find one. I mean, if the arrival of the flies was uh, miraculous enough, their absolute removal was totally, uh, totally remarkable. And that's what we really want to concentrate on tonight, uh, as we look at this story. Well, that was the plague of flies. Come, if you will, to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. And now it's particularly noticeable in the plague of locusts. So if you will, read with me from Exodus chapter 10 and verse 14. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. They did eat every herb of the land, all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, and there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste. And he said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat Yahweh your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated Yahweh. And Yahweh turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts, and cast them into the Red Sea, there remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. There was something very distinctive about these plagues, and particularly this plague of the locusts. The locusts clearly represented something, and even Pharaoh unwittingly said it himself. The locusts were a type of our sins. I want you to notice these points as you cast your your eyes back through those verses that we just read and see how the locusts are a type of our sins. In verse 15, they covered the face of the whole earth, obscuring even the light. Sin is universal. It obscures the light of God's truth. In verse 15, The locust devoured everything, herb, fruit, every green thing. Sin is insatiably destructive. Not a single thing escapes the effects of sin. Verse 16, even Pharaoh realized that there was a connection between the locusts and sin. He says in verse 16, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. It's the first time I think that he says that. He needed forgiveness. He realized that. And in verse 17, it says that the results of the locusts are described as death. Take away from me this death only. The wages, the inevitable result of sin is death. So the locusts are representative of our sins. And what was God's marvelous answer? To this plague of sin, verse 19, he cast the locusts into the depth of the Red Sea, and there remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. If the arrival of the locust plague was terrible enough, the utter removal of the plague so completely, so comprehensively, so perfectly was 
truly staggering. It was frightening and yet magnificent at the same time. So what I'm suggesting is that God's exquisite removal of the plagues so that not a single fly, not a single locust remained, was just a foreshadowing of what he was prepared to do to completely, utterly, totally take Israel out of Egypt. It was his determination to leave nothing behind, to deliver them from the cruel, hard, bitter bondage to sin. Because our our Heavenly Father has total power to remove the plague of sin comprehensively in our lives. Not a single fly or locust would remain. Now, we know that that must be true because when we turn over the page in Exodus chapter 10, in fact, it's actually on the same page, in verse 26 or verse 25, look what Moses says. Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto Yahweh our God. A cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. Do you know in the Hebrew, literally it should be, there shall remain, it's the same word as what we've already looked at in chapter 8 and chapter 10 with the flies and locusts, there shall remain not one hoof behind. This is utter removal from Egypt. So see how the plagues and their utter removal were going to be a foreshadowing of the fact that not a single hoof of the nation of Israel would be left in Egypt. This is a developing theme. Chapter 8, verse 31 of the flies, there remained not one. Chapter 10, verse 19 of the locusts, there remained not one in all the coasts of Egypt. Chapter 10, verse 26, there would remain not one hoof. The 10 plagues were to demonstrate how God could deliver them absolutely from the bondage to sin. So they were not just to impress Egypt with God's devastating power, that he could bring the plagues, but it was also to impress Israel with God's merciful forgiveness. He had the power to remove every last remnant of those plagues and cast them into the sea so that every plague that ravaged the Egyptians was utterly removed to prove to his children that he was determined to give them utter forgiveness, redemption, and deliverance. It was God's promise, not just of the inevitable consequence of sin, complete destruction, but of his desire, his offer, his promise to remove every last one of those things. Well, it was a wonderful story and a wonderful parable, a wonderful lesson. But human nature, brothers and sisters, very quick, is it not, to forget God's power and his promise. And if we turn over to your reading for today, Exodus chapter 14, the locusts and their remarkable removal were just a distant memory as Israel stood trapped on the shores of the Red Sea. The flies and the locusts and their lesson, pretty much forgotten because the Egyptians were behind them. And look what we read in chapter 14 and verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid and the children of Israel cried out unto Yahweh, And they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in this wilderness. All the lessons all the assurances and promises of God to utterly deliver them from the bondage of sin, the bondage of Egypt, were forgotten. Psalm 106 in verse 7 says, they remembered not God's wonders in Egypt, 
all his mercies, but provoked him at the Red Sea. Can you imagine our Heavenly Father? I removed every last fly and locust so that you could know that not one hoof of you would be left behind. And just minutes later, it seems, you've forgotten everything. And Moses has to reassure them, remind them of God's determination that he would redeem them. He would take them out. He would save them. He would have absolute victory. Look at what he says in verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Yahweh shall fight for you and he sh and ye shall hold your peace. Not one of the Egyptians will remain. Moses has to reassure them. And we know the story. We know what happens. It's summarized in verses 27 and 28 of chapter 14. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. And the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it. And Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And there remained not so much as one of them. The power of sin, the taskmasters of bondage, the army that seemed to threaten them with certain death were removed in exactly the same way as God had removed the flies and, the, and especially the locusts. Remember the locusts cast into the depths of the Red Sea? Here, the Egyptians cast into the depths of the Red Sea and there remained not so much as one of them. And the parallel is unmistakable. The power that threatened certain death vanquished. And what the locusts hinted at, the dead Egyptians should have made absolutely clear in the minds of the Israelites. And as the Israelites looked back from the safety of the shores of the Red Sea, it was clear, wasn't it, that God had enacted something truly remarkable. If the plagues could maybe have been explained away by the wise men's tricks or by freaks of nature or weather patterns, this was certainly a miracle. Both Egyptians and Israelites had walked across the seafloor, the very bottom depths of the Red Sea, but the Israelites had emerged, a resurrected nation. While it was abundantly clear that the Egyptians were still entangled at the bottom, Paul says that Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. Death to the flesh, personified by the Egyptian army, and life to the spirit, a nation raised from a watery grave to newness of life. It was an enacted parable of baptism. A remarkable thing had happened in their lives. Now, I have to say that when I was looking at this story for and thinking about how I had in, sort of pictured it in my mind and envisioned this moment, this little story has, has somewhat changed now in my imagination of the scene. Because before, I imagined that when the Israelites looked back, the Red Sea was like a carpet of floating, bloated corpses, the surface littered with thousands of bodies bobbing on the waves. That's how I imagined Israel looking back across the Red Sea, all the Egyptians dead and floating on the surface. And whilst chapter 14 and verse 30 certainly seems to indicate that there were some dead Egyptians evident on the shoreline, do you know that the rest of the scriptures gives us quite a different picture to that? I'd like you to look at our reading that we had this evening and look at how Exodus 15 and the song of Moses 
is going to describe quite a different picture to that one that I had previously imagined. Look at chapter 15 and verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. Do you know that that word drowned is the Hebrew word taba, and it means to sink? Chapter 15 and verse 5, the depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. The meaning of that couldn't be clearer, could it? Chapter 15 and verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. They were submerged. They were buried, never to rise. Chapter 15 and verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm, they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Yahweh, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased, still as a stone. Stones and lead brothers and sisters don't bob on the surface. These Egyptians were tied to the bottom of the sea forever. Hold your hand in Exodus and come very briefly to Nehemiah, because there's an inspired comment in the book of Nehemiah, hundreds and hundreds of years later, that describes this scene as well. Nehemiah in chapter 9. Nehemiah in chapter 9. It's a catalogue of the deliverance from Egypt, and look what it says. Nehemiah 9 and verse 9. Thou didst see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heardest their cry by the Red Sea and showed signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants and on all the people of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So didst thou get their name as it is this day. And thou didst divide the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land and their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as a stone into the mighty waters. And we get the overwhelming impression, do we not, from the scriptures that the Egyptians sunk, never to rise again. They were like stones held by an unseen force at the bottom of the sea. So coming back to Exodus and chapter 14 and 15, whatever Exodus 14 and verse 30 means, and maybe it means that from the seashore, the Israelites saw that the Egyptians were dead. My vision of hundreds of floating corpses is clearly wrong, isn't it? It's not what the scriptures say at all. Now, I imagine it like this. You can close your eyes if you want and just imagine this scene. It had been a terrible, terrible night. One that the Israelites would never forget. The intense darkness. The roaring sound of the wind. The blood-curdling yells and threats of the Egyptians, their violent taskmasters, yelling behind them. The sound of their galloping horses and chariots. Then the terrifying sound of thousands of tons of water crashing down, stifling the sickening screams of downing, drowning men. The cries of children, distraught animals, terrified in the darkness. And then, as the first gleams of the sun arose, pink on the horizon, in the eerie silence, as the Israelites looked back over the Red Sea, the thrashing waves were gone. It was like a mill pond. As Hymn 91 puts it, those limpid water's depth, their fury spent. And apart from a few dead Egyptians who had maybe almost reached 
the other side and who had drowned in the shallows, the Red Sea was empty. The brutal slave owners were utterly gone. And as they squinted in the early morning gloom, the horizon was deserted. The surface was dead calm. There wasn't even a ripple, not a sign of life. It was as if the dreaded Egyptians had never been. God had been faithful. Moses had told them, the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And so it was. Psalm 106 and verse 11 says, water covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. The waters were empty. The Egyptians had disappeared without a trace, gone forever. Not one remained. This is a lesson for us, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Is this how we feel when we approach the emblems on a Sunday? That when we come and we partake of bread and wine, we remember him, what he's accomplished, his absolute victory over sin, that not one of our sins remains. Not a single fly, not a single locust in all the land of Egypt. We know these words, but come, if you will, to Micah chapter 7. Because if we miss the significance of the flies, and if we missed the lesson of the locusts, And if we missed the obvious exhortation of the Red Sea, if we missed God's promise, his assurance to us, Micah is going to tell us plain. And look what we read in Micah 7 and verse 14. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan. And Gilead, as in the days of old, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. This is a description of the second exodus under Elijah. It's yet to happen. But Micah says one thing will be just the same as Israel coming out of Egypt. God will do marvelous things. And if we were to ask, what marvellous things, what wonders will God do? Micah tells us in verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. Can you hear those echoes back to Exodus chapter 6? He will turn. He will have compassion. He will subdue. Thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. And the greatest marvel, the most incredible wonder in our deliverance from Egypt, from the bondage of sin, is the forgiveness of our sins. And notice the language, cast into the depths of the sea. How many of them? All our sins, not one remains. And what the Israelites witnessed from the shores of the Red Sea was a type of God's promise to all of us to take our sins, those things that rightly relate us to certain death, and to cast them into the depths of the sea, never to rise, never to be revisited, never to float to the surface again, never to ever come back. This is the wonder the marvel of God's forgiveness. 
Sometimes, brothers and sisters, our sins can be as terrifying and as terrible as the Egyptian army. They threaten to engulf us, overwhelm us, overtake us, and we wonder if we will ever be free of the Egyptians and their bondage. We can't get away from them. They haunt even our dreams, but with God in the morning light, there's just an empty mill pond where once they were. Do you know, we won't go there, but our Lord Jesus Christ picks this up in Mark chapter 11 and verses 22 to 26, where in the very context of having faith and praying for forgiveness, he says, whosoever will say to this mountain, and he's talking about the Mount of Olives, famous for its history of idolatry, whoever will say to this mountain of sins, be thou removed and cast into the sea, he shall have whatsoever he saith, Mark 11 and verse 23. And what might seem like a mountain to us, brothers and sisters, is just a stone to our heavenly father. As Nehemiah 9 verse 11 says, their persecutors, thou cast into the depths as a stone into mighty waters, never to rise, consigned to the bottom of the sea forever. This is a story about the forgiveness of our sins. And so Micah gives us the lesson of Exodus 14 and 15. The wonder of the miracle at the Red Sea was not just the swamping and destruction of the sinful Egyptians, but the emergence from those same waters of a nation washed and cleansed and forgiven redeemed their sins typified by the Egyptians behind them, cast into the depths of the sea. But did you know, brothers and sisters, that it is extremely interesting that in all of the scripture, there are only three places where these two Hebrew words occur together. Cast into the depths of the sea. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 11, which we read before is one of them. Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, cast into the depths of the sea is another. And the last place in the scriptures where those two words, cast and depths, occur together is in the story of Jonah. And if Nehemiah chapter 9 is the what of forgiveness, deliverance from the cruel bondage to the Egyptians, and if Micah chapter 7 is the why of forgiveness because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and what God had sworn in truth unto the fathers, then Jonah is going to be the this, this story of the how of forgiveness, how our God was going to cast our sins into the depths of the sea. So come, if you will, to Jonah and chapter 1. Just a few pages, uh, a few pages back to Jonah chapter 1 and read with me this story and see if it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a similarity to the story of the Exodus. Because here, again, we are going to be presented with a story of ourselves, a description of our lives. Look at verse 4. Yahweh sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. They were unable to save themselves. This is a story of us. There's nothing that we can do with our own strength 
to save ourselves from what seems like certain destruction. We face certain death. We can't do anything else to lighten the ship. We're petrified. We are going down. And in that moment of desperation and fear, one man steps forward. Our lives are in his hand. And look what he says in verse 12. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. Here was a man who bore their sins on his shoulders. He was himself innocent, as it says in verse 14, lay not upon us innocent blood. He himself was innocent, but he willingly sacrificed himself for the world adrift on a sinking ship. And down, down, down he went like a stone, brothers and sisters, to the very bottom, to the depths of the sea, burdened with all the sins of the world and with a nature identical to all of those Egyptian soldiers. And we read of this man's mind in Jonah chapter 2 and verses 3 to 10. Here's the thinking of our Lord Jesus Christ. For thou hast cast me into the deep, into the deep, in the midst of the seas. That's the other time in the scriptures where those two words occur together. And the floods compass me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Yahweh my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered Yahweh, and my prayer came unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of Yahweh. Yahweh spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And for three days and three nights, he lay buried with our sins at the bottom of the ocean, declaring God to be right and our sins and his nature rightly related to death. His innocency made leaving him there an impossibility for God. And as Acts chapter 2 and verse 24 says, it was not possible that he should be holden by death. And the waters that compassed him about, even to the soul, were not strong enough to hold him. And God vomited him up out onto dry land. When Jonah looked out across the waters that had violently raged in that tempestuous storm, in his last memory, of what it was like above the water, the storm that raged was gone. And as he looked out upon the horizon, it was like a mill pond. And God's victory was complete. This is how our sins are cast into the depths of the sea, brothers and sisters. They're taken there and buried by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's done it, brothers and sisters. And God has raised him and exalted him to his right hand. So let's come in conclusion to Revelation in chapter 15, because if the story starts in in Exodus, it's going to finish here in Revelation in chapter 15. Because in Revelation 15, we read these words in verse. One, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvellous, seven angels 
having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are thy works, Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are thy ways. They are king of saints. This is a vision of the future. We know this is a vision of the kingdom because it is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It's only possible when our Lord is back in the earth and Moses is raised. And by God's grace, brothers and sisters, we will be there to sing the song of Moses once again. When Babylon will have sunk to the bottom of the sea like a millstone, as we're told in Jeremiah. We will be amongst those who have gotten the victory, verse 2, who are the saints of the king, in verse 3. We will stand in that day, brothers and sisters, upon a sea of glass, the perfect mill pond. We will remember the story of Exodus. Be so, so very thankful that in our lives, our Heavenly Father sent his Son to take our sins and to cast them into the depths of the sea, that not one of them might remain, that they might stay buried and gone and forgotten forever. This is the, the end of the story. This is the end of bondage and cruel slavery. This is freedom. And so, brothers and sisters, as we think on these things, as the sun rises each new day until the Lamb is here again, we are able, in our mind's eye, aren't we, to look out over the Red Sea, where once the darkness of the night, in that darkness, Pharaoh's henchmen almost caught us and carried us back to cruel bondage, and in their place, just see a sea of glass, the calm of sin forgiven, the stillness and peace of God's mighty hand. And maybe in that peaceful calm, we might be able to have the spirit of the mariners in the days of Jonah, who truly were able to offer a sacrifice and to renew their vows and say salvation is of Yahweh. When we stand on the shores of the Red Sea, brothers and sisters, and look back, none of it will have been by our strength. It's all by the power of our Heavenly Father, who has promised to deliver every last hoof of his people out of the bondage of Egypt and bring us into the promised land. What a wonderful hope we have. Let's strengthen our faith in these last days. Let's believe that God has not abandoned us, that he's not left us without hope and without salvation, that one day soon our Lord Jesus Christ will be here and we will be able to sing that song with him and sing forever of this amazing deliverance because he's cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Even so, come Lord Jesus.